previously, but he had this impossibly harsh and short life, as you've, as you've heard, and he managed to produce this poetry of incredible beauty and heart and uh, invention. And so what I thought I'd do today is briefly read um, from some of um, uh, translated biography reflecting on his childhood that I found during my research. Um, and then a short poem in translation of his uh, called Mother, about his own mother. And then we, um, a couple of poems that I've written, one that's inspired by that material. So I'll start with this autobiographical note about his childhood that was translated by Thomas Cadebo and Michael Bieber. I was born in Budapest in 1905. My father left the country when I was three, and the National Council in Aid of Children sent me to live with foster parents. Here I lived with, until I was seven in Osgood, and I started working as a swine herd, like most poor children in the country. When I was seven, my mother brought me back to Budapest and enrolled me in elementary school. She supported us, my two sisters and myself, by taking in washing and doing domestic work. She worked with a number of different houses and was away from home from morning till evening, so I was left without any parental supervision, stayed away from school, played about on the streets. In the reading for the third class, I found some interesting stories about King Attila and threw myself into reading books. War broke out when I was nine and our lot became progressively worse. There were times when I joined a queue at the food store at nine o'clock in the evening, and just when my turn was coming, at half past eight the next morning, they announced that all the cooking fat had gone. I helped my mother as best I could. I sold fresh water. I stole firewood and coal so that we could have something to burn. I made coloured paper windmills and sold them to children who were better off. I carried baskets and parcels in the market hall, and so on. In the summer of 1918, I had a holiday in Abatsia on the Dalmatian coast under the auspices of the King Carl Holidays for Children Fund. My mother was now ill with a tumour of the uterus. I applied on my own for assistance from the National Council on Aid of Children and went to Manor and spent a short time there. Returning to Budapest, I sold newspapers and trafficked like a little banker in postage stamps, and later in the white and yellow inflation money. During the Romanian occupation, I worked with a boy waiter selling bread in the cafe MK while also attending secondary school. My mother died in 1919 at Christmas time. So this is a poem that he wrote about his mother 15 years later in 1934. It's translated by Vernon Watkins. Mother. For a week now, again and again, thoughts of my mother have racked my brain. Gripping a basket of washing far on and up to the attic she passed. And I was frank and released my feeling in stamps and yells to bring down the ceiling. Yet someone else had the bulging jacket to let her take me with her up to the attic. She, just giving me no look or thrashing, went on and in silence spread out the washing. And kneaded clothes rustling brightly were twisting and billowing up lightly. I should not have cried, but it's too late for this. Now I can see what a giant she is. Across the sky, her grey hair flickers through. In the sky's waters, she's dissolving blue. So, as has been discussed after he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, um, Josef died during a visit to his sister, crawling through the railway tracks. And so, it was drawing upon various elements of, of that um, quite astounding biography that um, I created my own poem in response, and I was also inspired by one of his aesthetic feats as a poet, so he was arguably the first writer to produce transrealist poetry um, involving the transposition of time, so temporary scenes merge, which um, interrupts the linear coherence between past, present, and the future. Buck and slide, the sky swells and shatters. Mouths of men in power foam like rabid dogs, while all alone a mother scrubs their florid clothes from peach of dawn till dusk, when decades on her orphan son's shadow sidles into a station. At the far end of a platform, as the sun's embers glow, it remains statuesque, mute, during the roar of the incoming train, then the next, then the next. 
a morose procession of millipedes on a spider's web, carrying countless microbes from A to B in synchrony, as if any one of their destinations really mattered. No need to join that puddle of ever-present silhouettes, heads jutting like hens in dogged focus, scribbling specimens that grace the rails and noting to the second when. Those small, fat toddler hands once pushed canary engines over trammeled wooden puzzles, as if the rest of life, freshly polished, would post around a circuit of pure joy. A paper pusher steps aboard the 701 to work. At 703, he opens his paper, smooths the page, unscrews his dented metal thermos, takes a scalding sip that makes the headlines slip down warmly. Last strokes finished, bang on cue at 722. When the steam belcher clanks its way over the border from Zambia to Tanzania, cuts through blue acacias, pauses for tomato-hatted children to gather at windows, moves away to race a gangly-legged giraffe. While in the labyrinth under London, snakes on speed scream round narrow tunnels ruled by rats who nibble on stale sandwich crumbs and sculpt abandoned chewing gum into mice. A bullet zips through Tokyo's suburban blur, spears concrete clusters with precision, superhuman, never once lodging itself in the soft and mangled centre of a skull. Yet it's an appealing way to drive from the right ear through to the left and out the other side, blitzing the fetid sponge of guilt between oozing and purple memory. The nightmare on Trundle's near now, bearing snail letters inked with linear codes, sealed with saliva, scented only very lightly with the sourness of an anxious sister's sweat. A waft of it enters his nostrils, toes now poking over the platform's edge as he stares at the shiny rails below. They're ribbon-like and smooth as ice. They siren call to him to clamber down and glide along with one leg stretched behind him like a skater or to sink to his knees and crawl between like a baby to its mother. Such a neatly laid out route. Just follow the tracks, that's all. It couldn't be easier to encounter the cosy, gaping mouth of the oncoming monster. Um, so that's, that's it's all quite dark until now, so I thought maybe I'd finish by a short poem um, narrated by my mother. It's a slightly different feel to it. Good Countdown. Ten. One morning, sat and bleary, asking why. Nine. Allowing in unthinkable thoughts. Eight. I felt the imprint of your palm. Seven. Warm, the wingspan of my cheek. Six. Instinctive, nothing more. Five. But all resentment. Four. Fizzled off as. Three. Within a. Two. Figment. One. Glowed.